Hello, I am Narissa Golden, author and CEO of Golden Media, and this is the Aliogana Festival of the Word. This is the 2020 virtual edition, and we are so happy that you can be with us. Now, this year, the theme is words and art in activism. And we thought that it was important to have a conversation around social media and how we can use it to activate change. And so I'm happy to welcome these three guests today. And let me just take a moment to introduce them to you. First, we have Crystal Clashing. She is a pioneer in aquatic sports in her home country of Antigua and Barbuda. In 2004, at the age of 14, she became the first female swimmer to represent her country at the Olympic Games in Athens. She later joined Team Antigua Island Girls to become the first all-black team and first all-female Caribbean team to row any ocean when they crossed the Atlantic in 2018-2019. She has since taken up free diving and hopes hopes to establish a national record in her country. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Ronel for King is an Afro-Barbadian human rights activist and intersectional Caribbean feminist. And in 2016, she founded the viral social media movement, Life in Leggings, which later evolved into a grassroots organization, Life in Leggings, Caribbean Alliance Against Gender-Based Violence Through Education, empowerment and community outreach. As director, her role is to ensure that the organization fulfills its commitment to reducing the region's pervasive rape culture and helping to eradicate regional occurrences of gender-based violence. In 2019, she co-founded Pink Parliament, an initiative which encourages girls between the ages of 14 to 20 to consider careers in politics. She was awarded the 2017 Youth Hero Female Award by the Barbados Youth Development Council and the 2018 Queen's Young Leader Award by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at Buckingham Palace. Welcome, Ronel. Thank you for having me. Our final panelist is Chavelle Thomas, a self-taught photographer. Chavel has built a growing audience on Instagram with his alter egos, Shav the Kid and Dot Kid Shavi. On a daily basis, you will find this 26-year-old Antiguan either creating stories and imagery using things you can find at home or, concept or, or conceptual photographing others at various locations. His work has been featured in newspapers and magazines, including Simply Antigua and Barbuda and Islands.co. Take a moment and follow him on Instagram and connect with his amazing talent and his celebration of the beauty of melanin at the links you will see below. Welcome, Xavi. Thank you for having me. All right, Ronel, I'm going to begin with you. When did you realize that social media was a tool that was more useful than just for voyeurism? Um... Within my personal experiences, I realized that because um, Life and Leggings didn't, it was my first time utilizing it to speak about my experiences. It was my first time mobilizing people to also join with me to speak on my experience, on their experiences. But I, I was using social media in which to do so around, you know, particular issues of mental health and again, the same experiences of sexual harassment and so on and so forth. But I think my realization of, you know, that social media could be used as a tool to create change stem from other movements that came before me, you know, like Black Lives Matter and other um, cyber activism, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, Shavi, same question. How did you come out to decide that you were going to not just you were just going to find this way of telling stories using images. Um, for me personally, I did not really take social media that serious until later in life, honestly. Um, I, started, I started using it for fun and expression because I feel like I needed that space. Um, but I think between actually like being able to travel and people being saying, oh, I have you on Instagram or I see your face on Instagram, it was, it's more of it was more of a realization to me that, okay, cool, like, 
I'm not only reaching people in Antigua, but I'm reaching people, you know, in other countries. And so on that end, I just, you know, kind of strategize this in a bit that I can be able to not only express myself, but actually try and either inspire or, you know, just showcase culture in a way that hasn't been shown before. Okay. Crystal, when I think of the ocean and the Caribbean Sea, I am usually seeing it related to tourists and people we're trying to encourage to come and lie on a beach or white sand beaches or black sand beaches, whatever. But here you are using your social account to show a black girl in the ocean. When did you realize that not all black kids grew up actually loving the ocean and swimming? Yeah, um, the thing, I think I was lucky in Antigua at the time. Um, I started swimming in the 1990s um, and uh, there was like one major swim club on the island, the Dolphin Swim Club, and my parents enrolled me into that and, and I was five years old. And so growing up until I was about eight, I really, I thought it was normal for persons to go swimming to the beach, a uh, local population, because most of the persons in that swim club were of the local population, they were black, um, and I just thought it was really normal. Um, it wasn't until I got to my first meet when I was eight, um, and it, that meet was in Guadeloupe, and our team did horribly because we had no pools at home to train in, and so all the pool swimmers had an advantage over us sea swimmers because in the pool, you have to train harder, um, and I think that was the start of my awareness that it's not that we didn't have access to the beaches per se, we did. We didn't have access to pools. We didn't have access to the right training that would allow us to swim at a level and a competence that would allow us to feel more comfortable in our oceans. So that's oh. what it was for me. All right. So Ronelle, I'm gonna go back to you for a minute. I want you to tell me how did, what instigated life in leggings for you that you decided you were going to now use social media to around and build a, a following around this hashtag? Um, I would say frustration. Frustration with um, my experiences and how persons were reacting to it. Um, frustration with the legal system, frustration with how society in general was just acknowledging or not acknowledging um, the impacts of gender-based violence. So what I did was that I messaged a colleague and I said I had this idea. And um, I think just beyond posting my own experiences, I, I really have this idea for women to speak out on their own experiences and collectively kind of shut down social media <laughs> to pay attention to this issue. Um, this is not an issue that they can ignore. Um, it's not something that they could just, you know, dismiss and say, well, I don't participate in it, so it's, it shouldn't, it doesn't affect me. Um, I wanted persons to realize how pervasive this issue was, but also I wanted to put faces to these statistics. So when people see one in three, they kind of, they sometimes don't acknowledge how sometimes they are the one in three or persons like men mm -hmm. generally don't realize who the one in three are. So mm -hmm. it was a realization for them that one in three meant their friends, their family members, the women that they cared about, the women that they go to work with. And so it made them pay attention and mm -hmm want to learn more about it they felt they felt they were shocked because they they this is not something that they talk about often so they were surprised at one how how the women were coming forward so easily and um how no one no none of the women were surprised they were probably surprised at the level um of the the trauma but they were not surprised that it happened. Yeah. Because some of those experiences were very similar. Some of their experiences mirrored theirs. So wow. it was a, a reckoning and an awakening for the Caribbean society. Um, but 
I just, I wanted it to be a conversation that will continue. It's not just we talk about it today and then we move on from it. Because the thing about hashtags is that they don't trend continuously. They were right. never meant to. Mm -hmm. But there is a social impact, a certain impact that, for instance, when you see an instance of police brutality, you think of Black Lives Matter and the call to action. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, there's this is not right and there's something that should be done. And that's why I wanted Life and Leggings to to kind of roll as well, that this issue needed to be addressed and that we needed to pay attention and put pressure on those who have the power to, you know, create that societal change. Okay. And now you've taken that even further and you've started Pink Parliament. Um, what yes. are the lessons that you took from Life in Leggings that is now enabling you to probably even do it better this time around um, with Pink Parliament? And why that subject? Why now? So Pink Parliament is actually a project under Life in Leggings. <laughs> it, uh, but Pink Parliament um, is going to go on and be its own organization because the initiative has basically outgrown um, the space that it, it originated from. But um, what we wanted to do was to, with Pink Parliament, you know, there are women who we elect into office and people believe that because there are women that they will prioritize gender issues, but that is mm -hmm. not always the case. And we have a particular issue in legislation being implemented and it being um, drafted in certain Caribbean countries. So here implementation sometimes is a big issue, but you know. Um, so for Pink Parliament, what I wanted to do was address two things. I wanted to empower girls, young girls, to be able to take up space and to be able to use a platform in which they could speak about the issues that affect them, not have people speak on their behalf. Because I've been invited to UN working groups where I had to speak on behalf of younger women and younger girls, sorry, and how gender-based violence affected them. But I felt, even though I was there, that I shouldn't have been, that somebody who was of that age group should have been. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give them a platform to give them you know, the resources and the tools in which to be able to take a seat at the table and articulate you know, the issues that affect them and how they want and demand that change. Um, so we provide networking opportunities. We provide mentorship with female politicians and women in leadership. Um, as well as education. So we teach them about basically that politics is, or women's history in politics stem from activism really. Mm -hmm. And that they need to understand the journey of um, how we've gotten here and the rights that they benefit from, the women who lobbied for those rights, to be able to, when they assume positions of leadership or they get at the seat at the table that they can advocate for this generation and the next because the next generation and this generation will be beneficiaries too of the decisions that they make today and in their lifetimes. So to get them to understand that it's not just enough to be there, but what are you gonna do when you arrive there? Right. And so um, getting the mentorship as well with female um, politicians past and present because we're nonpartisan <laughs> um, across gender, uh, sorry, ac across political lines. Um, they, I found that young girls are more likely to see themselves in these positions when they speak with women who exist or have existed mm -hmm. within these spaces. And so we want them to be able to aspire to the highest office you know, for this office as well, because it's, uh, politics is not just um, elective, it's, you know, diplomacy as well. Right. And to be able to understand the power that comes with this, these offices and what they can achieve once they get there. Okay. Thanks so much for that, Ronel. Crystal, jump in here for a second. Now, I've been looking, I, you know, after connecting with you, I checked out your, your platform. And of course, the person who suggested that I reach out to you was actually Noelle, uh, Noelle uh, Singleton of Afro, hashtag Afro Swimmers. Mm -hmm. 
I initially wanted her to be on the project because I thought she was using her social accounts to talk about the fact that black girls weren't swimming and that black girls do swim and that we need to actually do more of it and that the whole industry actually needs to cater to them. Now, you've gone a bit further with that on your account in that on uh, World Mental Health Day, you posted a really important video about your own struggle with mental health. And I want to talk about that for a moment. Why did you switch or change or add this to your platform that now you recognize you could talk about something as important as uh, depression, bipolar disorder, that whole issue? Yeah, um, well, I, I had actually created that video a year ago and wow. I had actually um, I'd actually done a blog about my experience with depression uh, probably a year before that. And I had um, always gotten um, favorable responses, uh, responses of support um, when I had done my pre a blog post about my experiences. But sometimes that in itself was overwhelming um, mm -hmm. just because sometimes social media can be overwhelming and being in the space of um, not having the strongest of mental health at the time, mm -hmm. it, it just felt like a lot. Um, but when it came around this year, um, it felt like I, it, I needed to say what I had to say um, and I needed to share this message because one of the things that I felt um, for a long time um, was that I didn't know other persons who are struggling and I know I'm not the only person that struggles mm -hmm. and I think when you understand that other person struggle the way that you struggle um, it's at first a relief that you are not an anomaly um, two it means that with the power of more persons vocalizing what they are feeling and what they're going through solutions can be found. Talk to us about how you saw your social media accounts shift, change, make things happen for you this year. Okay, um, well, it was, <laughs> let me tell you, it, it, I did not see any of this coming personally um, because my 2020 was supposed to be a very great 2020 let's say i had a lot of plans but a lot of that didn't happen so i had to find ways and means to kind of show the current in a way that it's still relevant to what's going on right now but it's not like mm -hmm. throwback 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 um so yeah i did stay three months in well not not <laughs> i didn't stay three months i i got locked in three months in one shot <laughs> um uh, for three months yeah and then i came back over in a year on a base of getting therapy. Um, I had the idea in mind that I was going to be 14 in quarantine because that was um, the rules at the time. And there's two quarantine facilities where you're gonna get quarantined. So that was always mine because in my head, prevention is better than cure. So I had no problem with that. Got to the airport, um, you know, they asked the mandatory things, et cetera. And it was, it, it was very, very shifty the way that things were happening. And I kind of felt it going bad, but I didn't want to believe it was going to go bad. So when I got to current, so when I got to the hospital now to do my test, they told me they're going to be, I'm going to be quarantined there, which was kind of strange for me because in my head, the hospital was not listed as one of the quarantine facilities. So now here I am confused, puzzled. Everything is happening so fast. I have no communication with anybody much. Uh, I literally had to ask for the. I, I had to call my parents. Well, send them a please call me so they can call me to tap up my phone so I can actually have data on my phone so I can um, communicate and say what's up. Um, that in itself was a little bit traumatic for me because of the fact that I was in a I was in a holding um, holding room and everybody was treating me as if I had the plague. <laughs> I mean, I had no symptoms of anything, but I just, I, nobody really wants to communicate with me and nobody wanted to tell me like what was going on. So it kind of let me back a little bit because I was going to some mental health issues while in Montreal and to come back home thinking that, okay, I'm coming back home to get help and then I'm going to do all that again. You know, it was kind of a lot for me. And I only really put it into perspective only after I got back, um, I got out of it with took about two days and they only released me because I went to my social media, <laughs> which is a, 
you know, a lot in itself, but I won't go through that right now. But um, the shift in social media, um, I think it mainly happened um, on that basis because, because a lot of people were tuned on to that story in particular. I didn't expect it to get that much of a uh, um, viewing, I should say. Um, and my thing is that I, I built my platform out of a basis of transparency. So there was not going to be a, a time where I'm going to be telling you something that did not happen or trying to find up a nicer way to say something that has happened to me. Um, but what, did I, what I did do was I did not go on social media cursing or anything. I kind of twisted it into my narrative, whereas everybody knows me as a humorous person. So in that sense, I'd use humor to portray what I was feeling, even though it was a serious matter. Mm -hmm. And that in itself became content. I actually got content out of that. I got views and fellowship off of that. And I mean, like, even though it was such an unfortunate situation, I kind of turned it into a case of like, okay, cool. Like, now, you ha now I have the eyes on me. Let's talk about mental health. Because this is exactly what I came home mm -hmm. to do, to deal with myself. Because prior to that, I was off social media for over a month. Um, and even though I had made a couple of videos and, you know, a little content videos saying how much I miss Carnival, how much I miss, you know, how outside was, um, on the sidelines in private, I was going through so much. And I felt it was only that. But all so much you can do and so much you can hide and so much you can put behind with, until it comes back to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I came back home to, you know, to, to, to do therapy. Um, so after I started therapy and put a lot of things into perspective, I translated that onto social media again and I made sure that I let people know like, hey, this is what's happening. I mean, I didn't have to tell exactly what the situation was, why I was having these mental breakdowns, etc. But I did want to let people know that, hey, I'm not, you're not the only person. Like, I have been a very human person. I have been very much a life of the party, yes, but on the sidelines, I was going through too much. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to make people know that it's okay to not be okay at some points in time. And I took it upon myself to make a blog post on it. I took it upon it to make a um, couple content videos out of it. And then from that, I shifted it into, all right, cool. So I went through this. I'm healing. But that doesn't still block me from doing creative content. Right. So now I'm tapping into different, I'm tapping into different um, things that I, I haven't tapped in on this profile in particular. And it kind of blasted off from there. And I'm just happy to wait where it has been right now, where it has gotten to be. That's great. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you're doing so much better. Now, I, as I'm listening to all of you, I recognize um, and I will acknowledge that I am older. And so I realized that one of the questions I asked you was from my perspective as someone who remembers a time before social media. So it's like a, but you all have sort of grown up in an era where it's the norm to to have a device that you're connecting with. It's the primary means of showcasing your life, whether it's what you're wearing, you're going out, you know, what's important to you. So for you, it's much more normal to say, you know, this is what we do. Um, tell me what has it been like though, using these mediums to talk about the things that, especially for Caribbean people, we usually, see outside people talk about the, the stuff that we usually keep to ourselves that you say you don't ever talk about outside in the family what has using social media done for the messaging and how have you seen it impact other people the people that you choose to serve crystal um yeah uh that's a really good question but I think what I've seen, um, or what I've, first of all, what I've gotten out of it um, has been a sense of community. Um, one of the things I always saw was just that other persons, like you say, outside, like in, especially in the States, I always feel that their voice is so loud mm -hmm. that we don't get to hear ours. And yeah. that has frustrated me for no to no end for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to speak from the Caribbean perspective has been one that I think starts to resonate with those, not only in the Caribbean, but those in the Caribbean diaspora as well. Yeah. Um, and that's been great. Um, I think it's nice to hear our stories um, being told. And 
so many times they're being told for us. And so now I, I can empathize with you when you spend, you talk about persons or even you being in a position to speak for somebody else when ultimately, you know, persons can speak for themselves. Mm. Um, and I feel like as if that's where I'm heading towards and want to capture those um, voices as well. And that's that's where I'm ultimately going with my social media in the future and being able to connect as well with other persons of the diaspora um, through just Instagram messaging and then having chats via Zoom. That's, mm -hmm. that's came out of me for lockdown. I was, I ended up just reaching out to a bunch of people all over the world and yeah. just having chats with them about their experiences in diversity and in outdoors and in the water world as well. So um, that's been great. And I, I think it's just important that we keep lifting our voice up, keep amplifying our voices um, because they resonate, they really do. That's good. Ronelle, what have you seen happen as a result of Life in Leggings and now Pink Parliament with social? Um, first, I want to say I do remember. Good, good, good. Know. I'm not the only I'm one. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Like I, you made me go back through my memories. Like I remember, like getting my first phone, a big Nokia phone at eleven. Like I was like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> but um, for social media, what has come? Um, what social media has done? What What was the question again? As a release? Yeah. Thing? What What the impact you've seen social media has done for the message that you want to replicate and amplify? Well, what I've seen is that um, there's been a multi-generational um, knowledge transfer and exchange, really. Um, when I first began Life in Leggings, the first persons to reach out to me um, were the feminists before me, the feminists who laid the groundwork in which I picked up. Um, to apply to a, a cyber feminist um, platform. But they they reached out to me and they guided me. And I felt that I grew so much more um, in that short space of time that if I had tried to take this journey by myself, and that is an invaluable experience. Um, but it, it also, in doing so, it also allowed me to, to really think about the way that I wanted my message to be received. Because when I started it, I wanted um, you know the conversation to happen, but then everyone was turning to me for answers, and I was like, "Oh wait, <laughs> um, I don't have the answers. I I don't. Think all of us have all the answers. That's why we rely on each other. That's why we have this collaboration, you know. But um, I it made me realize again now the power of being seen as an authority figure and having to be responsible in the messages that you put out, especially on social media where it's so, where it's so um, easily accessed. One of the things that, um, one, of my, one of my cyber feminist friends who's around my age, <laughs> um, who lives in Trinidad, she put up a status and she said she returned to her old high school and um, she asked one of the students who are the feminists that she looks up to. And she called my name and I was like, <laughs> you know, I was surprised. And she said she follows me on social media. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have all these young, you know, people following me on social media and I need to be very careful about the things that I say. <laughs> I, Cause I, I didn't know um, my platform is very open for everybody. That's the intentions for it to be accessible. But I didn't think that there were young impressionable people who were also following me um and and latching on to the things that i say but um another thing as it relates to impact was that after life and leggings began um there were a lot of persons that saw the importance of such a movement long before i fully realized um the long-term impact mm -hmm. um, and so they started movements of their own. Wow. So Life and Leggings spurned off movements like Live Dominique in Dominica and Tambourine Army in Jamaica and so on and so forth. And so, and we all collaborate. <laughs> so it were, it, for me, 
social media gave me this this platform I, uh, that was I was able to get my message across, but also to receive knowledge of which that would help me better as a leader, a uh, youth leader, as well as an activist, um, and somebody who also is a survivor of gender-based violence as well, because while the movement was happening, I was also going through my own catharsis, but I was also reliving a lot of traumas as well. Mm -hmm. And so it, persons who, as I said, realize the impact, they also realize the impact on, it will have on me. And they reached out and they encouraged, they taught me about self-care and they taught me about, you know, having a strong support system. And so building a team in which could help me you know, take some of the weight off of me because yeah. this journey is, is a long journey. It's a heavy weight to carry and I can't carry it alone, to be honest. Yeah. So do, you all, do you all find that because you are, you're not just showing us what you had for dinner and where you're going out, that you have a responsibility then to <laughs> actually be a model 24 seven a day, uh, you know, how, what, how do you separate the personal from the the cause? Is there I, is there a difference? Yes, I have I have uh, three social media <laughs> accounts, and they do carry the same things, but I have different personalities on each account. Like okay. my Instagram is more of my personal side. My Facebook it does have a lot of important information. Right, it's right. So a joker kind of site, but Twitter is really where <laughs> um, a lot of where my important information comes out as well because. It does not. It does not have the same platform as Facebook or Instagram, in which things can get lost. You can right. easily find it. So, and long term as well, mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to find the the information. So I, I do that. But I will. I've said from the beginning. <laughs> um, I um. I I would like to think that. I inspire people and that I am a good role model, but I am also an individual and I have to live my life. I only have one life to live. So they need to right. separate run out the activists and run out the individual because I have many identities mm. as well. I'm a mother, I'm a student, I'm, you know, so if they can see those lines clearly, they need to see my personalities clearly as well. Okay. Shavi, is that why you created two different accounts? <laughs> Or any yeah, of them you because they like, or they're all go ahead. I think they all come from the aspect of Shavel. They all come from the aspect of Shavel. Shavel is this this like okay, is if for instance it's just like you have a bag of popsicles, but in the bag of popsicles you have different flavors. But all of them are basically popsicles, right? right. Not kind of, <laughs> I know this is such sort a of weird analogy, but it just came to my head. But like Dr. Shavi is like the, the, the photographer, the business side and um Shab the kid is more of the personality, which I mostly go on right now because I'm giving Dr. Shab a little break. Um, but okay. everybody knows, like, I think the, one, the, the main thing right now is to, when you start, so, when you start social media, is to, is, it's about starting strong. And when I say starting strong, I mean as what, what are you going to be building? What is the personality that's going to be the, 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 the forefront of this whole social media brand? And for me, Shab the kid, I started to shop kid as a joke. I, like, I don't take myself serious. Like, I'm very naturally humorous. I'm, I'm also creative. So that was my forefront. So now, so now, personally, I don't feel as if I have to, you know, go and even take a shower before I even bust up a picture on Instagram or even wash my face before I take it. I don't have to do all that because everybody knows that when it comes to shop the kid, it's a unapologetic thing. I'm going to... I'm, I have my little senses here and there, but... Honestly, my senses are only there because Instagram has senses also, and I ain't trying to lose my profile. But <laughs> um, mm -hmm. outside of that, it's uh, I, I don't feel much pressure, honestly, just because I'm the type of person that I am and the type of person that I have become. I mean, inside the social media, in the beginning, was a lot of pressure, of course, and you have you take in so much things on social media subliminally, and you don't realize that you take them, and then. All you do, you put yourself in a place, you start second guessing yourself, you start thinking like, oh, why am I not like this person? I don't look like this, why don't I look like this regular? And I know it'd be harmful to you. So it's more important to, you know, be comfortable fully with yourself to the point where it's like, you can see things on social media, but you realize that, hey, yo, I don't have to be this person. I don't have to be that person because I'm, I'm so comfortable being me. 
Right. Okay. So, Crystal, give us two things that you think um, people who might want to use social media to champion a cause. What are two things that you would suggest that they do? Um, uh, I'll mention the first two things that things that worked for me so far. Um, and one that is reaching out to the community that's around you that share your interests um, and the messages that you that resonates with you as well. Um, right just reaching out, whether it's commenting on, you know, their posts and stuff, but I really like the direct messaging. Um, I, I really like just reaching out to someone and just saying, hey, I really appreciated you posting something, um, you spoke to me and initiating a conversation there. Um, I think that builds strong um, collaborations for the future and it just brings strong relationships virtually. Um, because then you kind of scratch each other's back as you go along in your social media journeys. And the next thing I would say is finding your voice. Um, that's something that for me, it's taken a little while to do. I knew what my voice was, but I was having the courage to kind of speak on that voice and raising that voice. But I feel like I've now been able to do that. And um, yeah, I think just, just understanding what your perspective is all about and understanding that evolves as well, but being clear on your purpose as well is, is useful. Okay, Ronelle, what are two things that you would suggest to people who want to use social media to champion a cause? Um, I would suggest that they do a lot of research. <laughs> um, how would this message be received? Um, what are the impacts that you would like to see? Um, the outcomes? Who is the message for? And do you have a thick skin? Because social media is that tool in which there is so much positive, but there's also so much negative. And there will be people who are committed to missing your message. and it can be easy to like want to shut down and um, pull away from it. But once you know that your cause is important and it is something that is there to you, that you necessarily, you really want to raise awareness to be unapologetic and deliberate in your attempts. Um, I think also just understanding um, how these types of, of campaigns and trends can go. So plan long-term, plan short-term in terms of um, how you're rolling it out. Um, but also be prepared for, and I think the most rewarding part of it is that people will reach out to you after and want to share with you, um, being open to that. Okay. All right. So I want to thank Crystal Clashing, Ronel King, and Chavelle Thomas for joining me today on using social media for activating change. Here at the Aliogana Festival of the Word, we are going to put all of their contact information in the description and the comments. We hope that you will follow them and find out how you can support their initiatives wherever possible. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Take care, everyone.